Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg spoke publicly for the first time on Tuesday and was right after that arraignment, after unsealing the 34 felony counts against Donald Trump for falsifying business records. And he had charts to show the flow of what he called the catch and kill operations, the alleged illegal operations. The DA illustrating that scheme showing three hush money payments on behalf of the president, which, according to Bragg, were made to influence the 2016 election. These are felony crimes in New York State, no matter who you are. We cannot and will not normalize serious criminal conduct. The defendant repeatedly made false statements on New York business records. He also caused others to make false statements. We today uphold our solemn responsibility to ensure that everyone stands equal before the law. No amount of money and no amount of power changes that enduring American principle. Joining me now is former U.S. Attorney Paul Charlton. Paul, thanks for being with us. So in your analysis, and I know you haven't seen the evidence, none of us have, but as this narrative has been you know, laid out by the DA, and we've heard the former president's very strong denials. How strong is the DA's case? Well, I can tell you, Andrea, that the structure of the indictment is a smart one. It reflects prosecutors who have had a great deal of experience using cooperating witnesses. One of the great weaknesses, and we can begin there in this case, is that the prosecutors have someone who is, without exaggeration, a convicted liar, Michael Cohen, convicted of perjury. But what they have done in the setting up of this indictment, in the way that they have alleged these charges, is to find corroborating evidence. Principal among those, and perhaps one of the most impactful as you read the statement of facts, is a recording between Michael Cohen and President Trump, former President Trump, in which President Trump acknowledges the hush payment and suggests that the payments be made in cash. We have another witness apart from Michael Cohen. We have Mr. David Pecker, the publisher of the National Enquirer, and we have other documents. So that is a smart way to build an indictment. What we don't know, and maybe one of the greater weaknesses, is how the felony charges will hold up when they are challenged by Mr. Trump's defense attorneys, whether or not these election law violations will truly result in felony charges after the judge reviews these arguments. We'll just have to see. Now, the false business statements were made to conceal another crime. That's what stepped it up to a felony. He didn't specify, but they certainly, in the narrative, allude to tax problems and conspiracy. They, as I understand it, in talking to all of our lawyers yesterday, in real time as this was unfolding, they don't have to charge him with those other crimes. They don't have to charge him with conspiracy or tax evasion. They just have to show the intent to commit this felony in order to, if they persuade a jury, get a conviction. And all of this is assuming that, you know, the defense does not get these charges dismissed. And they've got a lot of preliminary, you know, opportunities to do that before any trial were to take place. That's precisely right, Andrea. So the way the allegations come about is that you have falsified business records in order to conceal another crime. The district attorney has indicated that the other crimes are state, and federal election law violations, as well as tax law violations. You do not have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt or set aside and put apart as a separate count those additional charges. You just have to show, prove beyond a reasonable doubt to unanimous verdict, those other acts were attempts to conceal another crime. And that is what the district attorney said during his press conference. That's what, in large part, the factual statement that was filed alongside with the indictment alleges as well. Paul, the hearing has not been set until December, and there was no move for a speedy trial by the former president to clear his name, to attempt to clear his name quickly before the campaign gets really underway in, in full throat. So that's curious. But also, what we see with Jack Smith, it's quite possible that this potentially much stronger case of potential alleged obstruction of justice from the classified documents at Mar-a-Lago, much easier case to prove, potentially, could happen even sooner. He could be charged with that pretty soon because they're in a they're pretty close to the final stages, we think, just from the witnesses that they're calling. They've, they've called the Secret Service members. 
That's right, Andrea. And if you think about what appears to be this aspect of the case, the obstruction of justice charge, it's easy to remember in a relatively recent history, cases, for example, involving Martha Stewart, in which she was investigated for the underlying offense of insider trading, but went to prison because she lied to federal agents. Oftentimes, it isn't the underlying offense here, the holding of classified information, the mishandling of classified information, but what happens when you are confronted with the allegations of that crime, obstruction of justice, that often results in someone going to prison because they have lied to agents, they have obstructed the investigation. Jack Smith seems to be focusing very closely on that aspect of it, including calling Secret Service agents who may have been on the protection detail with President Trump to help Jack Smith and the grand jury understand exactly what happened in the mishandling or the handling of this classified information.